But I've been real interested in, in when country citizens have big shifts. Brexit, Trump, Arab Spring. <clears throat> because with the classic economics, when you take like average income, GDP, you get these real nice linear trends. World Economic Forum gave an award to Tunisia just before that, all that broke for being a perfectly managed economy. Do you know why? Because they're managing it with classic economics. You got to know those. But for those economists, what you're taught is that, I get, I'm, ladies, don't use the word man because that's what it says in the book. It's built on one assumption that man is rational. And what it means is that all the decisions we make are based upon something rational. Numbers, basically lowest price, all that, you see what I mean? So we built this gigantic institution of running countries and states, organizations, built on classic economics. But so if you look at Tunisia, uh, Egypt, and Bahrain, perfectly, everything looks just great. And then it doesn't. So we know what people are buying and transacting, but there's no national institution or metrics for how you doing, how are you feeling. I want to show you something. We built this world poll. We built consistent sampling frames across 160 countries. We found 80 questions that if you ask these 80 questions to anybody on earth, there's nothing else we need to ask you because we know how you'll answer it. So if, if we ask the governor here, uh, if we ask him those 60 questions, the main base is 60. You say, well, you didn't ask him about if he's ready for revolution. We don't need to, because in combination, we can figure it out. There's really no other um, set of variables that you need to add to that to figure out, to figure out the governor. So anyway, that's our, that's our world poll. It's, 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 a list, it's a listening machine with a whole bunch of math in it. I wanted to show you this. That's my point. You see that? But see, economists look at that and they go, everything's fine there. By the way, that could be Tunisia. Remember what happened in Tunisia, that everything was fine and there was a, a, a street vendor, remember, and he lit himself on fire, changed the world. And remember that guy, Mohammed Bouzizi? Why did he light himself? What did he, when he was burning, what did he yell? I'll give you a pop. Can you do quizzes? Is that, can I give him a quiz? Because I don't want to. If it throws your show off, I don't want to do it. Did he yell, death to America or Allah U Akbar? Which one did he yell? Huh? Ne neither. What did he yell? He yelled, I just want to work. His license was for so we have a question that we ask. You can do it with yourself. If, if on a 1 to 10, or on a 0 to 10, if 0 is the worst possible life and 10 is the best possible life, where are you on that ladder, a ladder of 1 to 10? So let's say you say a 6 or an 8. The next question is, five years from now, where do you think you'll be on that ladder? So if I say right now I'm an 8, where will you be on that ladder five years from now? And I'm a four, that's where you find hope. Because that means I don't have hope. So sometimes you look at a country and you'll say, how can they have so much hope? Well, it's because where they are now is a two. And if you ask them where they'll be in five years, they say it's a six or a seven. They can have more hope than an American. And Americans are starting to have not, don't have hope. But I'm just telling, I'm doing this because I'm gonna lead it all the way to India, but beware when that starts to crash. There's the Arab Spring. I'm not blocking anybody, no. That's the, that's the answer to how you're feeling. But we can't see it coming because we just keep tracking the damn transactions of life. We don't, we don't track the, emotion, the emotions of life. We say, could you pre predict the Arab Spring? We've never seen an Arab Spring. But what you could predict is that hell's coming in some way. But see, what happens when you get this way, what you want is a good definition of leadership is where you lead people. But what happens with this is that's where the people lead the leaders. They, the people take charge because the leaders have lost charge. I was just going to show you all countries, this is what it looks like. It kind of comes out of place, but right now what we found is people are going to wonder how they do that. Most of, these, uh, most of the world we do in person. And um, that's what the scattergram looks like 
Um, these polls are deadly accurate because we get no refusal rate. So in America, everybody hangs up on us. <laughs> they do. They didn't used to. When I first started doing this 40 years ago, they, everybody would participate. Then you get down about 50% non-response bias. You can't. And then you get. You can still correct it. You know our response rates are in these kind of countries, 100%. Every, they can't believe somebody's coming to ask you their, nobody's ever asked them their opinions. Hell, you can't, they'll go, come on in for dinner, let's go, you know. We're, and, but that's what, that's what it looks like. And, and it covers 98% of the population. So if you said, what's the whole world thinking, that gets you pretty close. That's what it looks like, so that's our guy there. We have 35,000 contract interviewers. He's sitting there with that thing asking that lady. That's in Indonesia, let's see where this one is. Mongolia, I'm gonna do these pretty fast. But, but, and, and again, we do them everywhere. Country coverage, we, we, we basically get them all, whatever those are, some places where uh, there's some kind of uh, de deadly uh, uh, autocracies where they'll kill our interviewers or something. <laughs> but we found out that, I'm, I'm not gonna do that for you. The, the, if you're in trouble, I'll just do one. The, the, if you wanna talk about great leadership, and I'm sorry, because there's a lot of things wrong with this. Rwanda, when you have a country that is just in total chaos, slaughter, famine, everything, you know, suddenly the Singapore of Africa, how the hell did they do that? So let's say that it's us. We gotta go fix Rwanda. This is the hierarchy. We kind of redid Maslow's hierarchy, but you can't just start working on jobs. You see the point? So it's a, uh, um, algorithmic. You gotta lock the place down first. Then food and shelter. I gotta have enough nourishment in my body so I got some batteries. I got, I, you gotta get my batteries filled up. Institutions and infrastructure, that's just a lot of stuff you think. You gotta have some police and all that. The biggest one there though is corruption. Corruption's really deadly. Um, it, um, but anyway, you get the point. All the way up to what you really want is quality GDP growth. I'm just gonna keep going. Ukraine. Not great, but you could, de you could live with that. Of course, there's the revolution. Look at that thing tank. See, it tanks about two and a half years before. But you know what our, you know what our analytics are? A low score is not as bad as a diving score. So there are some countries that go along that people are just miserable, but I guess they go, that's how we do it here. Do you know what I mean? But you see, if you're like England, and you're clear up here and you're doing well, it's the downward trend. That's why it's hard to do one point. I feel like I'm, some of this is boring. But if you have a point in time, so I just do one poll for you, you're missing the biggest parts of it, and that's the direction it's heading and the speed. So one point in time, spot polls, all that, uh, can really be misleading. There you go. Tracking the irrational or the emotional well-being. Watch this one. These guys have been killed. They've been doing really well. There's Brexit. Here we go. See what it predicts? But so if you would have said, Jim, what's kind of, I, if you had asked me back then, you'd say, no, let's say about right there at 40%, you would have said, Jim, what, um, anything, you, uh, what's going to happen in England? Uh, I, I don't know, but there's going to be a shift because leadership has lost it. The citizens are running the place. The people with the pitchforks are coming in some way. Um, uh, 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 Egypt, they're actually just coming. Uh, Brexit, whatever leadership's for, the guys with the pitchforks are against. They, they want chaos. They're tired of voting for Superman, they want the Joker. <laughs> that, may, that may have happened here. <laughs> that wasn't a political point, Deepak. Everything I say is technical and clinical. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Look at that one. You ready? This one's okay. Somehow the, 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 that's holding together better the, the, than I would have guessed. Okay, this is the this is this is the money page. <laughs> ready? Not good. So if you were to make a prediction, whatever's coming up, leadership's losing control. There's just no question about it. 
I don't know what that means shifts. They could come back. But when they start going like that, if you notice our other slides, they're very difficult to pull back. And I mean this on something is very seriously wrong in India. I don't know how to say it. I don't know how to say it any other way. Okay. Can you bring that next one up, please, and thank you real fast. Uh, with God as my witness, I have never done a slide presentation in my life. I don't have anything against slide presentations. I don't even know. I don't know where you get slides. Maybe that's the problem. Uh, I think it was Jeff Fortenberry said the very, very core. I'm looking at my well, t climb time here. Hold on. Uh, so I have seven minutes or something. So America's dynamism is really in trouble. And there's no two sides to it. You keep hearing about the recovery. You can read it not just in the uh, voice of the left, the New York Times. You read the Wall Street Journal. They keep talking about a recovery. There's no recovery at all. I don't know why we say that. It's a narrative that the elite media, when I say elite media, I mean you can see it on Midday and Fox and everything else they're talking about. There is no recovery. If you take GDP per capita, remember, you don't just take GDP, you've got to divide it by the number of people because the number of people is increasing. Over the last 20 years, that number is just like this, and now America is at zero. Economists know that, but the media just won't write it. I don't think it really matters with presidents because it was coming down with Bush. They go, well, let's change and try Obama. It accelerated. So now I don't know what happens. I don't know what happens with Trump. I don't think it makes any difference what he does, because there's some force on that that's stronger than than, than, than politics, which means it's going to, I'm talking about the United States. I don't know how we pull that out. And you know how it manifests itself in that. So GDP per person, which is basically potential income per person, continues to go down. It's grinding the life out of the middle class. So my brother-in-law used to make 45000 at a dog food plant or something like that out in Grand Island. He loses that job, and so now, he, now he's making about 16000 Falls into depression. Uh, Deep had to save his life with his heart. Uh, everything's wrong with him. You know what he did? He lost his dignity. And when you read 4.4, whatever the unemployment rate is, he's invisible in it because he's still full-time employed. You see what I mean? I estimate, we estimate that at least 10 million Americans have had that same thing, and especially white males. You know, they're killing themselves more than ever. I don't know if you read that stuff by Angus Deaton and, and uh, Ann, uh, his wife Ann. But <clears throat> that's what no recovery looks like. All of us are one degree away from those 10 million people, too. Uh, the middle class is being crushed. If somebody said, what's your most clean answer on why Trump won? I would say, first of all, Hillary had to do every single thing imaginable wrong, which she did. Bad candidate, uh, emails, uh, calling people degenerates, whatever that one word, deplorable. I mean, every, she had to do everything wrong. But then how could Trump win? It's having a great big block of people that are really in job trouble that nobody knows about or nobody's, nobody's listening to. Oh, so you have a crushed middle class. The next symptom of no recovery is um, lack of business success. I know the market's up. I'm not going to talk about that. That's completely outside. That's in a whole different stratosphere. It doesn't matter. But if you take the number of publicly listed companies on the New York Stock Exchange and um, uh, NASDAQ, 20 years ago there were 8,000 of them. Right now there should be 12,000. There's 3,500. The companies can't grow. You know, this, all Bain people know this. The companies can't grow. They've given up, so they just acquire. And it also gives them convenient monopolies, and that's, that's what you see that's happened. Next thing is, remember what happens before that are IPOs, because IPOs become those, of course. IPOs on a good year would be about four or 500. Big year, 700. You know how many we had last year? 100. This year, we're at 70. It's, it's a lot to think about. We're not going to need Wall Street in my, in, my, in my lifetime. So you say, how did we get here? But you see, again, it's that stepwise regression thing. Uh, algorithm it's the, is that millennials don't start companies. Nobody starts companies. And that's what Jeff was talking about. We're at the lowest per capita. But it's like if we own a big herd of cattle, you're in Nebraska. And, and so Mike comes to me and says, Jim, how's the herd, of cat, how's the herd doing? 
And I said to him, they're dying faster than they're being born. That's exactly what's happening. And what happens before me not starting a business has to do with, I'm just going to show you, I'm just going to show you one. Because this is kind of a, this is a miserable chart for India. I think this is all fixable. That's why I like Rwanda. That's why I like Nashville opposed to Memphis. You all been there? Memphis is awful. It's like Detroit. Nashville's hotter than Austin. It's probably the hottest town. If you want a small town, Sioux Falls, a really an odd one. Pound for pound, the most productive people in America are probably in Nashville and Sioux Falls, not Sioux City. Sioux, Fall, Sioux City's awful. It's, it's the Memphis, Sioux, Sioux, Sioux Falls. <laughs> you see here, government makes it easy to start a business. Look where China is. U.S. is okay, but <clears throat> see what you don't like about India is the direction of, this, of, the, of the piece. Okay, now I'll look at my last one. But, but there's a question about how a country's doing about corruption. Do you think it's corrupt? We overwrite the question. Do you think corruption's widespread in your government? It's a, it's a wonderful predictor of, of chaos. So when I say chaos, chaotic voting, <clears throat> Brexit, maybe here, um, filling the streets, too many protests, all that kind of stuff. A really good score is kind of 12 to 20 percent. That's where you have Sweden and Austria and Denmark and all those kind. The best ever is four, of course that's Singapore, and they don't have any corruption, or you disappear. Um, <laughs> another marker is Germany, they're at 35. You, you, you can do that one because you just have some kind of cranky people that blame, that say corruption is widespread. Get this one. It just jumped in the United States to 75%. You, you can hardly manage citizens when it's like that. And in the United States, the trend's the wrong way. But those trends have so much force on them. But I wanted to end on a high note. We look deep into in data analytics. One of the real problems in India is, so, so there's about one billion adults in India, adults, 16 years and older. And of those, two thirds of them say they wish they had a full-time job. 30 hours a week with a paycheck for an organization and all that kind of stuff. There's only about 300,000, am I doing it right? 300 million. 300 million. Uh, let's call them good, good jobs. OECD and ILO will say that there's 600, they count informal. I just wiped those out. I'm not counting selling flowers and traffic or something. 300 million. When we ask those 300 million how well they're being managed, they're their well being in the workplace. A good score is 50 percent. Somebody cares about my development, some nice, just some numbers like that. In India, it's five. Isn't that amazing? How bad can you be at managing? These people, these people hate their managers. <laughs> but that's the bad news. The good news is that's fixable. God, I mean, if you want to work on that, two, three years, two, three years, you could fix it. I mean, the people in the world have done bigger things than just fix a, work, fix, a, fix a workplace. But I wanted to end on this note. Something's going right there. Because you know your job as a leader, when you have a, a bad number like what that, 80, say that would have been 82% or something, which would have been one of the highest in the world. Lebanon's 95. I don't know what's going on there. But <clears throat> if you came and said, Jim, how can I fix that? What should I do? You know what I would tell you? Leadership's job is not necessarily to fix something, a phenomenon that big. It's just to get it headed the right way. Because once you get it headed the right way, and, and so that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a real positive. I wanted to do those deep because a couple of them are very searing. And I'm 100%, I'd bet, I'd bet the whole Gallup organization that they are 100% accurate. But I think for India to work on those, remember, uh, we've learned a lot from each other because America has almost exactly the same problems. Thank you very much for having me.